All righty, welcome back, everyone. Um, please take your seats. Uh, we are ecstatic, uh, and, and as a Duke alum myself, uh, I'm particularly ex excited uh, to have such an esteemed alumnus uh, up here on stage to have a fantastic conversation with uh, both Shelley and Sophie. So I will leave it to Dean Bolding uh, for a more formal introduction, and then we'll get the keynote underway. Okay, so uh, welcome everybody. Uh, it is, I think, a real privilege for all of us to, to have David with us here today. Uh, honestly, David is one of my heroes. This is a person who has had incredible impact in everything he's done. Uh, very interesting background, of course, he is connected to Duke as a Duke alum. Uh, went on to law school, decided he didn't like practicing law, entered the Carter administration, and has done all of us an enormous favor uh, by getting interest rates and inflation at such a level then that today's environment seems positively mild by comparison, uh, but uh, went on from uh, being in the Carter administration to founding Carlisle, and Carlisle has been uh, an incredible success in the private equity world, and they've, they've made a difference within that very competitive landscape by essentially being more relatable, more personable, more decent uh, in terms of the ways that they interact with one another and with their clients. Um, David has invented this notion of patriotic philanthropy, and so he loves this country. And one of the things that, uh, that he thinks is incredibly important to this country is education and higher education, where he sees that we have an advantage and he does not want us to lose that advantage. So in addition to his patriotic philanthropy, uh, indirectly he's supporting his country by investing enormously in higher education, and Duke is lucky to be one of the schools that, that he, he believes in. The last thing I'll mention about him in terms of his love of this country is the thing that, uh, that I think is the most amazing thing that he's done is he is, uh, he, he is an, a historian. I mean, so this is what he does in his spare time. Uh, he has an incredible grasp of American history, and it's something that he feels like our members of Congress maybe should know more about as well. And so, uh, so David has put on events for, uh, for uh, members of Congress to educate them about this country, and which is valuable in and of itself. But the other thing that it's done is it's actually gotten Democrats and Republicans to literally sit down at the same table during these events. And so without further ado, I give you David Rubenstein. And Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey. Thank you for that kind and overly generous introduction, and you're very lucky to have a great dean. He's done a spectacular job here, so thanks very much for what you've done for Duke, Bill. Okay. David, we're so happy to have you here today. Thank you so much for coming. It means a lot. Well, you have a low bar of happiness. <laughs> David, you may not remember this, but we've actually met before. Where did we meet? <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. I give you the benefit of the doubt. You've been busy interviewing the likes of Warren, Warren Buffett, Ken Griffith, and then, of course, Jeff Bezos. But actually, it was in October 2021. You were here at Duke hosting a distinguished lecture series with Dr. Jim Kim. Okay. And for those who don't know, he okay. is the leader of the World Bank. Right. Yeah. And so um, during the Q&A, I asked you a question, which I'm still curious to hear your response to. Okay. What advice do you have for some, I love your poker face, and what advice do you have for someone like me who always smiles when they speak? <laughs> advice to get a job or to yeah. go forward in life, or what would yeah, you say? Yeah, in a board meeting or get a job. Well, uh, I would tell you, I've interviewed thousands of people over the years, I've hired some. I hired uh, some people I didn't think would, would make it. They did well. I, some people I turned down, uh, you know, I made a mistake on. Uh, one person I hired was a guy, he was okay, he was a former government official. He was in our firm for a while. I didn't think he'd amount to that much. He left. His name is Jay Powell. Um, oh, nice. He's somewhere in the government now. 
I hired another guy. I thought he was okay, and he was at our firm for a while, and then he uh, turned out to be elected governor of Virginia, Glenn Youngkin. So, uh, you know, sometimes people leave and they go on the government things. Uh, I would say, to be very serious, uh, when I interview people, what I'm looking for is somebody that's reasonably intelligent. I don't want a genius. Geniuses are hard to manage. I've tried to manage them. It's too <laughs> difficult. Looking for somebody that actually is reasonably articulate. You don't have to be Martin Luther King, but reasonably can speak in a way that's, that's understandable and, and knows how to present him or herself. I'm looking for people that know how to write because writing is an incredible skill that some people I find still don't really uh, have as much as I would like. I'm looking for people that have uh, the ability to think about something other than their own career uh, and their own personal self. They would want to give back to society in some ways. So um, I'm looking for people who also want to do, let's say, private equity, if I'm interviewing for that, that they understand why private equity is useful. And I think it is because you can make companies better, therefore you can employ more people, you're good for the country when you have that, it makes productivity better and so forth. And I don't want people who say that if, that if there was no carried interest of 20% that they were gonna get a piece of, they, they would be uninterested in. I'm looking for people that think that private equity and investing itself does a, does a useful thing for society. Um, I'm also looking for people that um, I have some degree of humility and modesty. Um, now we have some people that are great in the world that are arrogant. I, you know, some of them become president of the United States sometimes, but, but <laughs> as a general rule of thumb, I think some humility is probably useful. And somebody that wants to be a leader in the end, somebody that's gonna do something that makes me think this person is gonna be better than just the average person just going nine to five and, and has a willingness to work pretty hard to get there. So looking for lots of things, but I have no doubt that um, you don't need advice from me. You're doing well already. <laughs> I hope everyone jotted that down. But um, well, we want to kick things off. You're an esteemed Duke alumnus. We'd love to hear about your experience as a student here. Can you take us back to 1970? Well, it was a different university. Uh, to be very serious, a Duke University was, um, I, I had planned to go to some other schools, and, but I was an equal opportunity applier for scholarships. Whoever gave me the biggest scholarship, that's where I needed. <laughs> my, my father worked in the post office. Neither of my parents graduated from college or high school, and I needed money to get somewhere. And I, I, didn't, I got the application for Duke the night before uh, it was due. I didn't have a typewriter, so I, and I have terrible handwriting, uh, because I think handwriting was taught when the Jewish holidays occurred. So I never actually, um, <laughs> I, my handwriting was terrible. So I, I didn't think they could read it. Maybe because they couldn't read it, they admitted me. So they admitted me and they gave me a reasonable scholarship. Um, but Duke in those days was a uh, school that was mostly a Southern school, um, relatively fewer people from the Northeast or the West, very few international students then. It was a school that um, was, I would say, more religious than probably I was in, in some ways. Uh, when I got here, I, I, it was a little bit of a disconnect. Um, in my uh, undergraduate class, there were 12 African Americans. Uh, Duke had desegregated for undergraduates in 1963. So, uh, and, and there were relatively few people who were Jewish. There was an, in, uh, there was an informal Jewish quota, which was not un atypical in universities in those days, but Duke had a, a, about a 5% Jewish quota. So um, there were relatively few Jews, relatively few uh, blacks, um, virtually nobody uh, of Asian descent, uh, virtually no international students, and it was just a different world. I, I was, you know, people made fun of me because I came from Baltimore and I had a Baltimore accent. I said, wait a second, you have this accent, I can't understand anything, it's a southern accent. Um, but to, uh, to Duke's credit, uh, Duke has risen in a way that I would not have predicted at the time. Um, in 1966, when I entered, uh, there were a number of other southern schools that also had been segregated for much of their history, and among them were uh, Emory, uh, Tulane, Rice, uh, University of Virginia, um, Vanderbilt, and if you think about it, who would have predicted 50 years ago that only one of those universities is uniformly in the top 10 universities in the United States, and that's Duke. So Duke did some wonderful things, a combination of lots of factors coming together that made it rise above every other southern university and now is uniformly in the top 10 depending on your category, uh, who does it, US News or somebody else, top eight, seven, eight, nine, whatever it might be. But Duke has done that without an industrial base from a relatively small city. 
And it did it because a lot of people came together and said, we're going to make this a great university. So it's a different school completely than the school that I, I attended. And when I was chair of the board here, um, we made a lot of changes to kind of improve the, the, the campus. It's, I think, much uh, more beautiful campus than it was before. We did many things to encourage more people to come to the school from uh, uh, overseas and, and, and from other parts of the country. And I think now the, school, the, the state that, that has the most people coming here other than North Carolina is California. So was, when I was an undergraduate here, we had hardly anybody from California. <laughs> so it's, it's changed uh, completely and it's still a great school. No, I, I bet. And I'm sure like, as you've seen, you've been so active at Duke, but when it came time for your 10 year college reunion, did you come or were you too busy working for Carter? Well, um, when I was, I don't think anybody knew that I was in the class. Um, <laughs> um, you know, if you had said, that, you know, in my day, the, the, the leading person in the class was probably the Leo Hart, who was a football player. He was all ACC quarterback. Um, and, you know, I don't, I mean, if you had asked people if I was in the class, nobody would have known I was in the class. So I mostly just, you know, tried to get by and not, you know, get in trouble. And so I mostly studied. So I, I didn't come to my 10th reunion. I, I haven't come to a lot of reunions. I think there was, my 50th was supposed to come, but we had COVID. And so I, uh, we didn't actually have it. Maybe we'll have it at some point. I'm about to go to my 50th law school reunion. And you know, the problem with going to your 50th reunion is you, you don't recognize a lot of the people. And uh, <laughs> you know, it's, it's different, you know. So uh, you know, when you go there, I'm, I'm not sure I'll recognize half the class. I'm sure they won't recognize me. Uh, but uh, I, now I haven't, I've come to do what I can to help Duke. But I, and I, the reason I want to help Duke is Duke gave me a scholarship when I needed it and gave me uh, an undergraduate education. And I think you, um, you, you get attached to your alma mater to some extent. Obviously, many of you are in business school. And my, I'm attached to the University of Chicago. I'm the chairman of the board there now. And I try to give back to that school because they gave me a scholarship as well. So I try to give back to um, schools. And as, as Bill said, I do try to give back to American educational institutions. I'm also a member of the Harvard Corporation. And the reason is, I think our universities are, our great are among our great national assets. People come from all over the world because they want American education, higher education. And so it's one of our great resources and it's not just to educate people anymore. They are great places to convene, but also um, places to do research. And the combination of, of convening for uh, getting conferences together like this, uh, research, education, is just what American universities do, I think, better than any other universities in the world. So that's why I think if you want to contribute to your country, to some extent, if you contribute to American higher education, you're, you're contributing to your country. And that's why I you know, wanted to stay involved with the universities I've been involved with. So David, we'd love to spend a little bit of time talking about your time in the Carter administration. Um, we'd first just like to extend our condolences to the entire Carter family. We're thinking about them during this, this difficult time. Um, but let's paint the picture. You know, you started working for the Carter administration in 1976. Um, you know, back then you're looking at inflation by 1979 of like 14%. Today, we have inflation of, of 6%. Um, a little bit different, as Dean Boulding, you know, alluded to in his introduction. But um, you know, we we seem to see maybe some parallels between the present day and the Carter administration. What do you see in terms of parallels? Well, um, I'm, I'm sure Joe Biden doesn't think hope there's no parallels because we didn't get reelected. Um, <laughs> um, the U.S. and Joe Biden is a friend of mine. I know him reasonably well, and. Um, you know, I lend him my house for Thanksgiving for times for, and he went to place to go for Thanksgiving. So I've known him for a long time. He was the first senator to endorse Jimmy Carter when Carter was running for president. But uh, it's a different world. In the, in the 1970s, and the, and the high inflation started really um, after the, uh, the Arab oil boycott of 1974, uh, when, Israel, when, when Israel went to war with its, some of its Arab neighbors in 1973. Uh, the U.S. resupplied Israel at a time when Israel wasn't doing so well in that war, and that caused an Arab oil boycott, which increased uh, oil prices from roughly a dollar and a quarter a barrel to roughly uh, four or five dollars a barrel, went up 400 percent. So think about this today: if oil prices went up 400 percent, not four percent or 40 percent. They went up 400 percent. That fueled inflation, and began uh, to be, began to be seen in the Nixon administration. They had wage and price controls, which didn't really work. The Ford administration had a win program, whip inflation now, that didn't work. Carter inherited a lot of that, but we also had some other challenges ourselves. And, 
the economy in the United States was different then. Roughly 25% of the people were unionized. And while not disparaging unions, they probably can push up uh, wages a bit. Today, the United States has roughly 10% of its workforce unionized. Completely different. In those days, most of the products used in the United States were manufactured in the United States. Today, we have this global supply chain, and it's designed to make things uh, less expensive. And therefore, uh, even though we're now changing a bit, uh, we, we, we have products and services coming in from overseas that kept inflation down. So we're not as insular an economy as we were in the 70s. And we also are, are, are not as dependent on oil prices from overseas because uh, I would say now we produce roughly 10 million barrels of oil a day. We consume 14 million barrels a day. Well, we produce roughly 10. And in, in those days, we're probably producing five or six million barrels a day. So, uh, and we're using, we were using a lot more than that. Um, so uh, the, the economy's changed completely. I think uh, uh, we probably misunderstood how serious the inflation was early on in this administration. Uh, in the Trump administration and the Biden administration, they injected $5 trillion into the economy without corresponding tax increases. And for a while, when inflation began, people said, well, it's transitory. Well, it wasn't transitory. And so they're playing catch up. And they may catch up for a while, but it takes a lot longer to get inflation out of a system than into the system. And I think the mistake that we're making right now is we're probably trying to get inflation at a lower level than probably it should be. When I was in the Carter administration, we brought Paul Volcker in to be the chairman of the Federal Reserve, and we told Carter, you won't get reelected because he's going to produce a recession, which he did, and Carter didn't get reelected. Carter didn't care about that. He didn't want to do the right thing. Well, we had inflation at 2% for 25 years. Now we've used to it. Most of you have never lived through inflation. Now that it was 8%, now it's down to maybe a year over year, 6%. It's still too high for the politics of the era. I think the Fed is now trying to get it down to 2%. I think that's going to be too difficult to do because it will require a corresponding unemployment rate to go to about 6%. And that may be not politically tolerable. I think the Fed should probably go to 3%. and That's pretty tolerable. But anyway, I think it's going to take a while before we see inflation out of the system. And I think uh, the Fed uh, is probably not going to in decrease interest rates this year. Uh, the markets thinks that they will maybe next year, but it's too early to say. So it's a different kind of economy than we had then. Certainly. Um, and we will we'll come back to inflation. But um, you know, one more question I wanted to ask you. Coming out of the Carter administration, um, there was this you know, hallmark of the speech, which was the crisis of confidence speech. Um, and in the crisis of confidence speech, um, you know, Carter talks a lot about not only the energy crisis that America was facing, but the deep divide that had, um, that had been created between kind of Washington and the American people. Um, did you have any part in writing the crisis of confidence speech? Okay. So um, you're very kind to not use the word malaise, uh, which is that <laughs> that speech was known as. What actually happened is uh, Carter was struggling with uh, a new energy policy, nothing he'd proposed seemed to be accepted on Capitol Hill. And Carter came in, he wanted to deregulate um, oil and deregulate natural gas prices, which, which was seen as a terrible thing. Uh, the deregulation of, of energy world was something that was just too far in the future, and he had a lot of problems getting it through. So he was making energy speeches from time to time. And what actually happened is he had a speech that we'd given him. Uh, the speechwriters had given it. I worked on it with others. But, and then he, he read it, and he didn't like it. And, he, he, and, that, and they had an advisor named Pat Cadell, who was his pollster. And Pat Cadell said, there's kind of a, uh, the country's in a malaise, and people aren't really feeling good. It's, they're too narcissistic. And, uh, and so as a result of that, Carter went up to Camp David, and he kind of just communed with himself, and he started bringing prominent people up there to spend time at, at Camp David. And they're trying to, he's trying to figure out, what should I do to lead this country? Well, the country was kind of saying, wait a second, the president of the United States is taking people up to get ideas about how he's going to lead the country. He's the president, he should know. And it was a bizarre 10-day period of time where you heard nothing from the president of the United States, and he uh, was consulting with people. They were, they were telling people what they were saying to him. It was, it was bizarre. And Pat Cadell had a lot of, had a Svengali influence. He was a young pollster, 26 or 27 years old. He had a Svengali influence over Carter because when, when you're a pollster, you can go into a president and say, here are the numbers. I have the numbers here. This is what people think. These other guys will tell you what they think, but I have numbers. And so the numbers had a, a disproportionate impact on Carter and Mrs. Carter. And so uh, the vice president of the United States was very upset about this. He threatened to resign. He almost did, but he didn't. Um, then Carter finally came down from the mountain after he had um, done some other things and gone out to meet with average people. It, it seemed strange. Uh, he gave an energy speech. 
that talked about his energy policy, it was later characterized as the Malaise speech, which he never, a word he never used. The speech was so popular because he seemed to be more energetic than he ever had, had been before, and he actually parted his hair on a different side than he had before, so people <laughs> didn't, almost didn't recognize him. He, he, uh, his popularity went way up, but the next day he stepped on his own thunder by saying he wanted all the cabinet officers to resign. Now, in European countries and parliamentary systems, um, it's not a common to have or atypical to have a uh, parliament or have a cabinet resign, but it had not been done in America. He asked for all of his cabinet to, to submit a resignation letter and accepted those that he really didn't want to have stay anymore. But it it produced a disjointed view of who was in charge and and whether Carter was really up to the job of being president. And so he, I think had he just left the speech the way it is and not fired large members of his cabinet and made some other changes, it wouldn't have taken on the the image that it did, what, that, that, that it was the so-called malaise speech, but it, it was poorly handled, as he would admit today. If the, let's say, if the crisis of uh, confidence speech had been you know, executed perfectly or maybe written differently um, and had rallied the American people, how might you rally the American people today? How much? How might you rally the American people? How would I? Yeah. Well. You know, if I had a good answer, I'd be in Iowa and New Hampshire already, but, uh, <laughs> you know, as I've said, look, uh, you know, leadership is not easy in a country of 330 million people. Now, think about this. When our country was first started, we had um, 3 million people in 1776. Half a million were slaves. They couldn't be in government. Uh, there were 10,000 Jews. They couldn't be in government. There were a lot of people who were... Um, not property owners, they couldn't be in government, and then you had half the population were female. So when you eliminate all the people who couldn't be in government, you had about 500,000 property-owning Christian men. Out of that, you got George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, Benjamin Franklin, um, Alexander Hamilton, James Monroe. Now we have 330 million people. Where are the, where are the George Washingtons? Where are the great people out of this big population, which is now 100 times bigger than we had? Well, my theory is they're all in private equity. Um, <laughs> but but uh, the, the, uh, the, we have lots of problems, and I can't go through them all now, but let me just give you one problem that is, exists today. Uh, in the House of Representatives, we, um, we, we basically have 75 members living in, the, in their House offices because they can't afford to have a second apartment in Washington, D.C. We haven't raised congressional salaries in more or less in 20 years. So members of Congress are making less than all of you when you, when you leave this school and go to a workforce, you'll make more, as a, whatever job you take, you'll make more than members of Congress make. And you could argue maybe you're more valuable than members of Congress. But, but I, I think it's a sad situation. And the result is members of Congress are spending a lot of the time on, on things they shouldn't be spending time on. And they're all obsessed with raising money, not for themselves necessarily, but raising money. So um, members of Congress, House members, spend 40% of their time raising money. And you do that by appealing to the far left or the far right. There's nobody that you raise money from and says, I want you to be right down the middle and take a, a, a balanced decision. There's no money to be raised from that. So members of Congress are calling for dialing for dollars. They call it all the time. And as a result, um, you have to be on the far left or far right to get that money. And therefore, you have crazy situations um, where Democrats and Republicans rarely socialize with each other, rarely talk to each other. They don't see each other in conference committees anymore because there's no more legislation as to which there is a conference committee. It, it's not a good situation. The thing that Bill was referring to is I, I started a dinner seven years ago um, where um, once a night, once a month, and I do, I'll do it tonight with John Meacham, um, where I interview a great historian about American history to kind of educate members of Congress. And you know, they like it, but the reason they say they like it is they say they can actually come and see people from the opposite party, the opposite house, with nobody seeing them, and they're not going to be politically uh, criticized for it. But we have a situation in Washington now where it's so divided that, that it's no, not easy to get people to, to cooperate, and, and it's really a, a sad situation. I think our democracy's had worse problems, and obviously the Civil War was worse, but it's not pleasant in Washington, D.C., and I don't see anything getting better in the, in the near future. The Republicans' mission is to make sure Biden doesn't succeed, and Biden's mission is to, you know, get control of the House and get reelected re again. And, and those two things are going to produce uh, not uh, a pleasant outcome, I think. That. So take the debt limit bill. Um, 
the idea that we're going to endanger the credit limit of the United credit, credit uh, rating of the United States uh, over something that we have to do uh, is, is silly to me. But but the Democrats and the Republicans can't seem to come together. Now they will come together, but that won't be defaulted on. There's a law in Washington, a rule in Washington called Parkinson's Law, and a rule. And basically, it's that. Um, the amount of time it takes to solve a government problem is exactly equal to the time available. And the time available will be June the 15th. By June the 15th, we'll have to solve the debt limit, so they'll solve it by June the 14th. We won't default. But it's, it's, it's a very unpleasant environment in Washington. And um, I, if I had a solution, I, again, I would be going to <laughs> Iowa, New Hampshire, but it's, it's not pleasant right now. What I'm, what I'm hearing is that financial, uh, private equity professionals should step in then. And well, I'm wondering if we'll draw it back. You had a very recent interview with Jane Frazier, Citigroup yes. of CEO of Citi, and you asked her a question, which I kind of want to flip around. If the Fed chair or Janet Yellen calls her during a board call, does she take it? And then what advice does he, she give on bringing down inflation? So what would you do if Jerome Powell? Well, um, I, I interviewed Jane Frazier, the CEO of Citi, which is interesting. She's the first woman in the 250-year history of our country to, to, to run a major uh, money center bank. Um, and she's from Scotland, a Harvard Business School graduate, very intelligent, worked her way up Citi over some 20 years. Um, but Citi has got some challenge in itself. I mean, of the four major banks in this country, it's the smallest by far, and its stock price hasn't moved in 10 years. And after the Great Recession, um, Citi did a 10-for-1 reverse split, and its stock went from, like I say, six to 60. It's today in its 50s. So it's basically not moved in 10 years. Um, so Citi is, is OK. It's not financially challenged. But it's got some real problems. And they're, they're much smaller than the big three. Mm -hmm. um, she, I would say if, if, if Jay Powell asked me what to do or uh, Janet Yellen, there's no, then Jay Powell's not going to ask me because I, I got inflation of 15% when I was in the Carter <laughs> years. So he's not going to ask me. <laughs> but I would say that uh, what Jay Powell has to do is just be clear on what he's doing. He's done a pretty good job in trying to explain what he's doing. The Fed chairs used to not explain what they were about to do or what they did. Now they, they, he does it, and he speaks English in a way that Fed chairs often don't speak. So I think he's done a reasonably good job, but you just have to be consistent. His message is, I'm going to tackle inflation. Maybe unemployment goes up, but I, I've got to tackle inflation. He's going to be known for tackling inflation or not. He's got three more years in his term. He won't serve another term. So he's, he wants to leave knowing that he beat inflation down to 2 or 3%. Um, and I would just tell him to be steady as he, as he goes. With Janet Yellen, um, you know, I, I'm surprised she's still there only because I, she didn't really want to be Secretary of Treasury. Um, Biden talked her into it. She was already retired. I think she took the job when she was 74, which is old for a Secretary of Treasury, not for a presidential candidate, obviously. Um, <laughs> and, and so. Uh, I, I, I thought she would leave after the midterm. I, I was wrong. I think she's enjoyed the job now more than she did. Um, she had to work, obviously, hard to get the banking problem more or less addressed. It's not completely addressed. But I think she's done a reasonably good job in trying to deal with that problem that we had a couple weekends ago. Right. Speaking of the banking process, Jane also said we're not in a credit crisis. Do you think we are? We're not in a credit crisis in the way that we were in 2007 and 8, where the major banks were under-equitized and they had enormous amounts of uh, bad loans, um, from, from, particularly from mortgages, which were um, so-called so subprime mortgages. Subprime means not credit worthy. And so we don't have that problem. The problem we have now is a bit of a lack of confidence. Um, and therefore, you also have uh, the bank, Silicon Valley Bank's problem was that they were just um, growing too rapidly. And they, they, didn't, they made a mistake in hindsight that nobody could have predicted at the time. They, their, their balance sheet wasn't strong enough, so it was advised by Goldman Sachs that they sell some assets, and Goldman actually bought them. But the, the assets were, I'd say, $1.6 billion and they've been uh, carried for. And so when you report a $1.6 billion loss, it scared everybody. What they should have done in hindsight is sold the assets down maybe more slowly or not to one party and not had that big number come up. And then it made everybody realize that that when you buy even treasury bills, the treasury bills of your 10-year treasury bills are not worth what you paid for them because the, the interest rates have gone up, the treasury bills have gone down in value. So I, I think the financial crisis we have is not as bad as anything we had in 07, 08. And uh, I think the US banks are pretty good. The European banks are a little more challenged. Obviously, we saw what happened to Credit Suisse. 
I don't know that something similar will happen in any other European banks, but on the whole, I don't think that we have a credit crisis. I think we have a, a bit of a miscommunication and lack of confidence problem. And so we'd like to move uh, just to the founding of Carlisle yes. um, as well. So it's interesting, you founded Carlisle in the early part of 1987. Black Monday obviously happened right. later that year. Um, what's it like founding a company um, maybe in a, in a recessionary time or in a, an economically hard time? Well, I, I, you know, I, I worked at the White House, and when I worked at the White House, people told me I was a bright young man. I was 27 when I went there. I, finished in 31. I thought Carter would be reelected. I told him, you, you, you're, you're running against an old man. He's 69 years old. Ronald Reagan can't possibly get out of bed in the morning. He's so old. I'm now older than that. So I don't think 69 is that old. But I thought we wouldn't lose because I thought in the end we'd get the hostages out and people would recognize Carter was smarter than Reagan and so forth. But we were all wrong. So all the bright, all the people told me I was a bright young man and hire me if I wanted to leave the Carter White House. I, I called them afterwards and they didn't want to hire me anymore because they didn't want a Carter White House aid. So I practiced law in a, in a firm that wasn't that well known. I wasn't that good at it. My clients reminded me of that all the time. And so I read about Bill Simon, who had been a Treasury Secretary in the Ford administration. He did something called a leverage buyout. I didn't know what it was, but he put in $1 million to buy Gibson greeting cards and of his own money, $1 million, and he made $80 million in 18 months. I said, that's better than practicing law. I don't know what a leverage buyout is, but I got to <laughs> find out. So I tried to formed the first leverage buyout firm in Washington, and I didn't have any experience, so nobody really wanted me to be involved with them. Finally, I convinced a few people who had some experience in finance to, join, to come to a firm I was gonna start, and I told them I, was gonna, I had the money, but I really misread, misled them a bit. I, I meant to say I was gonna get the money. I didn't have it. <laughs> uh, and so we raised, I raised five million to start. Um, I, I, I said to the leasing agent, I don't want to have more than 10 people ever in the firm, so I only want space for 10 people. Um, I thought it'd be a small little boutique firm, and then we obviously grew for other reasons I can describe later if you want. Um, in, in October uh, of uh, 87, we had the crash, which today doesn't seem like so big, but it was 508 points in the Dow, or roughly 23% of the market went down. So I'm thinking, okay, this is bad timing. I mean, uh, I'm starting a firm, and a couple of weeks later, we, we have this crash, but in the end, since we hadn't made any investments yet, uh, we, didn't, we didn't lose any money. Um, I, I, I would say it was, you know, if you're going to be an entrepreneur and you, 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 you hire McKinsey or the equivalent to tell you whether your company is going to make it or not, you'll probably not start any company. Entrepreneurs start companies when people tell them they probably, probably couldn't do it. Um, entrepreneurs are people that are willing to walk through walls and are willing to take risks and, and also they don't know how little they, they don't know. If I had realized how complicated private equity was or how little I didn't know about it, I would never start a car I'd still be practicing law. Um, so if you're anybody's in, interested in being an entrepreneur, you have to ignore the McKinsey's of the world or the uh, consultants. And I, pick, I don't want to pick on McKinsey, but BCG, Bain, all of them. They're going to assess for you, uh, you know, why you can't do this. And, but anybody that's an entrepreneur is, is basically doing something that somebody told them they couldn't do, almost by definition. If somebody thought it was good, somebody else would have probably done it. So I, I, I didn't know anything about private equity. I didn't know anything about investments. So I, I did it because I didn't realize how little I didn't know. Um, now that I know everything that I now know, I can't imagine why I started the firm because I, I was stupid to start it in Washington, D.C. with no experience, but it worked out. Yeah, well, that's perfect timing because when you think D.C., normally you think politics. Right. Just like New York City, you think Wall Street, Silicon Valley tech. When I say re research park triangle, what do you think of? When you say? The, uh, the research park triangle, the RTP. We, we, you mean the research? Oh, it's a triangle park. Sorry about that. What do I think of it? <laughs> yeah, what do you think about that? When Terry Sanford um, uh, was president of Duke, he, he had been governor and, uh, and he became president, I think, in 1969. Um, he came up with other people, the concept of Research Triangle Park. And it was a brilliant concept, which is to say you've got three leading universities here and let them uh, take some of the advantages of their graduates and technology and, and professors and build a kind of an entrepreneurial park. It, it had its ups and downs over the years, for sure. Um, it, the research triangle, in many years, didn't live up to its promise. I think it's now coming back. And one of the problems that this area has had is there isn't a lot of venture capital money. So it, in Silicon Valley, you can walk down the street and, and you know, trip over all the venture capitalists here. There's so much money there. Um, 
And in, in this part of the, of the country, there just hasn't been that much venture capital uh, money. I have uh, you know, looked at what we can do here to invest in more money here because there's, there's a lot of good people here who are able to build companies, but many of the people here, when they have a good idea, they, they leave the area because there's more ca capital in Austin or there's Silicon Valley or Boston. And I think what, what this area really could use is a really a couple strong venture capital firms that are willing to you know, back people in this area. There are a couple that have started and they've gone out of business. Um, Duke is now working on trying to revive it to some extent with, with a couple uh, programs it has and maybe it'll work. Um, and I, I would say investing here is probably a better uh, performance opportunity than maybe in Silicon Valley because less competition here. But I think Research Triangle um, is going to be, I would say, more uh, likely to succeed in the future because many of the bigger tech companies are now moving here and they're opening facilities here and universities are, are more willing to, to consider entrepreneurial activity. Uh, when Duke, you know, when I was here, the, the word entrepreneur didn't really exist and if you wanted to be an entrepreneur, you had to go somewhere else. Now, many people are willing to stay here and Duke is willing to encourage people to stay here. So I think it's a much better atmosphere than it was you know, 20 or 30 years ago, but still we have a ways to go. So let's talk also about um, the people that you surrounded yourself with when you first started Carlisle. Um, in the fall, you had an interview with Andrew Ross Sorkin, and you said to him that collaboration is a gene that some people have and some people don't have. Um, you may have heard that Team Fuqua is a big thing here. Um, I'm curious, when you founded Carlisle, did you surround yourself with people who had that collaboration gene, or did you find that out later? Well, um, you know, there's always going to be masters of the universe who think they don't need anybody else, uh, and you try to avoid them if you can. But you want to want people that have their egos in check and are willing to cooperate. And you know, I measure this to some extent by people who say we versus I. The most popular word in the English language is I. But people that use the word we, I think it's better. I always try to have a culture of collaboration. In fact. You cannot accomplish anything in this world without other people helping you. No matter, even if you're Einstein and you come up with E equals MC squared, you have to convince somebody that E equals MC squared, C squared is right. You have to cooperate, you have to, how do you persuade people. So how do you persuade people to collaborate and work with you? And how do you become a leader? Well, there are three simple ways. One is learn how to talk very effectively. So you can persuade people to do what you want, your child, your partner, your, 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 your professor, your, your colleagues. You have to figure out how to persuade people, and you don't have to be, again, Martin Luther King, but be, persuade people. And then learn how to write reasonably well. You don't have to you know, write uh, you know, uh, you know, the, the same way that Thomas Jefferson did or, or the persuasiveness of um, you know, William Shakespeare or something like that. You don't have to be Shakespeare, but learn how to write in a way that somebody can read it and succinctly understand what you're talking about. And then the best other way to persuade people to follow you and be a leader is to lead by example. When George Washington was fighting the Revolutionary War, he stayed at Valley Forge with his troops. He didn't go down to the Ritz-Carlton down the street. He stayed there and said, I'm going to put up the, with the, some of the suffering. He obviously had less than some of them. But, uh, you know, so leading by example. And I think that I look for people that know how to do these things. They write well, they talk well, they know how to collaborate and lead by example. And that's a collaborative culture that I think works. Now, there's always going to be somebody like Steve Jobs, who is a brilliant entrepreneur and who has such a creative uh, mindset and is so driven that, that he can persuade people to follow him even if we isn't his first word uh, to use. Um, and so there's always going to be some of those people. But if you look at the odds, the odds are better of a business succeeding or success occurring if you have a collaborative culture than if you just depend on a Steve Jobs showing up, in my view. So in addition to um, assembling your team at Carlisle, you've also been given the, the distinct privilege of uh, forming the investment committee at places like the National Gallery. Right. Um, curious, when you were selecting the people to be on the IC at the National Gallery, what kind of skills were you looking for there? Well, I'm the chairman of the board of the National Gallery of Art, and uh, we wanted to have, an, and I'm also chairman of the investment committee, and so I wanted to bring in some outside people, and so uh, I, I, uh, I thought we could use more diversity, so we uh, brought in three extremely talented women to serve on the investment committee. Uh, one of them is Kim Liu, um, who is the 
uh, the daughter of a Chinese uh, parent and an African-American parent, which was not that popular at the time that her parents conceived her, um, and that their, 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 the grandparents uh, disowned the, the parents practically. Um, she uh, did go to Wharton and Harvard Business School. She was at Carnegie Corporation for a while, Ford Foundation, now she's the Chief Investment Officer of Columbia University. I had lunch with her actually yesterday. Uh, another person uh, is a person who um, wanted to be an art uh, conservator, and um, she ultimately wound up uh, going to Yale School of Management, and then uh, ultimately became the uh, head of the endowment for Bowdoin. And for the last 10 years that she was running the Bowdoin Endowment, had a, it had a higher internal rate of return than any Ivy League school, uh, including Yale, where she had come from. And she's now uh, the chief investment officer for the Rockefeller University and put her on the board. And then a woman named Afsana Beschloss, who had been the chief investment officer for the World Bank and treasurer of the World Bank. So our investment results have been very good. And uh, we put those, those women on in part because we were um, the National Gallery of Art when the new uh, president came in, 97% of the paintings were from white, white men. So we've tried to change who the artists are, but also tried to change who the who we invest with, and we have much better diversity in the, the people with whom we invest our, 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 uh, our endowment. So, so I, I was looking for smart people. Um, I wanted some diverse backgrounds and happened to get three really talented women. That's great. And, um, and I know Shelley wants to ask you a fundraising question, so I, I'll just okay. ask you one, one more to kind of segue into that. But um, in your book, and How to Invest, um, you, you interviewed Sam Zell. And Sam Zell said that both of you guys succeed with a combination of ego and humility. You succeed because you're able to adjust that ego and humility backward and forward to achieve your objectives. Is that, um, is that related to fundraising? Is that related to hiring? How is well, that? Um, I have much to be humble about. So mm -hmm. I, I do have some, a fair amount of humility. I, I recognize um, when I went to high school, there were a lot of people so much smarter than me. When I went to Duke, there were a lot of people smarter than me. When law school, people were smarter than me. Uh, and, and as I, I said in my uh, book on leadership, um, I divide life into three parts. And you know, if you're really, you know, the people who win the first third of life don't necessarily win the second and third third. So I wasn't a Rhodes Scholar. I wasn't a Supreme Court clerk. I wasn't a great athlete. I wasn't student body president. I was nothing. Nobody in my college class even knew I was in the class. And really, nobody would have known. Um, if I, if, you know, nobody knew I was even in the class, since I'm sure people are surprised I was in the class. Um, I, I would say that people who are like the tortoise and the hare, ultimately, if you have less skills than some of the people who are the superstars in the first third of life, if you keep working, eventually you'll master some skills, and, and you win the second and third third of, of life. And I spoke to a group uh, at, at the Kennedy School the other day, and they're called Young Global Leaders, picked by the World Economic uh, Forum, uh, the Davos people. And I said, look, the trick in life is not to be a young global leader, it's to be an old global leader. Uh, you know, you want to be a leader of the world, not when you're in your 15 or 20 or 30, 25, but later in life when the, probably the benefits are greater. So to all of you who say, well, how come I'm not a Rhodes Scholar, I'm not first in my class, don't feel bad about it. You know, you have an advantage because you're going to try harder to get to the next level. And as I did, I, I, I worked harder because I realized if I was going to get anywhere, I had to work work harder than other people because I wasn't as talented as other people. So, um, you know, that, that's how I, I, I looked at it. And, um, you know, to some extent, I, I think Sam Zell is a person that nobody would have predicted him to, to be as successful as he did. He's a, he went to the University of Michigan, University of Michigan Law School, never practiced law. He got into real estate and he turned out to be one of the best real estate investors in our country's history. And I, I, I wouldn't, humility is, wouldn't be one of his virtues, I would say. Um, <laughs> you know, he's a larger than life figure. And you know, if you feel you you are really more talented than the average person, and you can't be humble, you can fake it. Just pretend you're humble, because <laughs> um, humility goes a lot further than uh, than than arrogance. Now, obviously, we've had some presidents of the United States that are arrogant, but are they the role models you want? I think that what you want are role models or people that are are more humble. Now, Alexander the Great attached the great to his name. Well. You know, is that a good idea to, to do that? Maybe, maybe, maybe not. So I would say, in the end, uh, people who are humble are actually probably better leaders. If you look at the, the books, some of the books I've written, the people that actually risen up have a fair amount of humility to them because they realize they've made mistakes, they realize they're not perfect, and those are the people you really want to have as role models, not the people that are telling you how great they are. 
Excellent points. And of course, talking about humility, we do have to brag a little bit about you because in our Carlisle IPO case, we read that when you used to walk into a, a fundraising meeting with a sovereign wealth fund, you wouldn't, if you left with a check size of less than 500 million, you would consider it a negative MPV or a loss. Why? Can you share a story with us? Um, let, let me put it this way. Um, I did not have an MBA. Uh, when I was an undergraduate at Duke, uh, to be honest, the, the best students um, went to medical school uh, in, those, that, in that era. That's before doctors were just you know, dealing with insurance companies. The, the best students went to medical school. The second best went and got PhDs. The third best uh, probably went to law school. The fourth best went into their family businesses or they didn't go to graduate school. The least best went to business school. <laughs> Because in those days, it was, it was, you know, there were no hedge funds. There were no private equity funds. There were no tech startups. If you went to business school, you were going to go work for IBM, Procter & Gamble, Morgan Guarantee. And you know, 30 years later, you might rise up. But if you were Jewish, you probably weren't going to rise up. Or African American <laughs> probably weren't going to rise up. So it wasn't that appealing to people. And um, it, it, was a different, it was a different era um, in, 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 in that sense. And so I, I uh, you know, would say, I didn't consider going to business school at the time. I wish I had. Uh, all of my children have MBAs, and all of my children are pursuing now what I call the highest calling of mankind, private <laughs> equity. All three are in there. So I, I, I wish I had had that uh, insight at that time. I, I just didn't have it, and I, I got lucky later in life. Um, but um, I don't know. I, I, I would I, I'd say all of you, um, you know, are blessed to have a business school degree, or will have one from a very good school, and take advantage of it and try to figure out where you can make your way in the world. Find something that nobody else is doing. Think of way how you can make your, your presence in an organization valuable. Master one skill. Master one area of expertise so people will come to you and say, yes, this person is really good at area A. Let me give them area B to work on. Then if they're good in area B, they'll give them C. And you rise up. But try to find something where you can make yourself knowledgeable and, and really, and you enjoy it. And I tell my own children, I tell people when I give a commencement speech, you, it's rare to find a Bill uh, Gates or, or, Jeff, or, or Mark Zuckerberg who drop out of college and they do what they're gonna do with the rest of their life, more or less. You have to try many things and experiment and you'll never be successful unless you find something you really love. Nobody won a Nobel Prize hating what they do. You have to love it. And if you find your first career job is not good, get another one and get another one and get another one. I didn't start Carl until I was 37. And so you might say that's old that's to start a company, but that's when, when I decided I, I was ready to do something and I wasn't happy with the other things I was doing. So you gotta find something you're really, really happy with and, and, and pursue it, in, in my view. So let me, I, I didn't fully answer the question you asked me before about the fundraising, let me just address it again. Um, in the private equity world, the highest part of the totem pole is always thought to be doing the deals. And the lowest part was to doing the fundraising. So when I went to, when I started Carlisle, even though I started, it was my idea, you have to be useful, otherwise you can get kicked out. I mean, Steve Jobs got kicked out of the company he started. A lot of founders get kicked out. The founder of Uber got kicked out. So you can get kicked out of your own company. So you have to make yourself valuable. Well, I didn't, I didn't really have the MBA skills because I didn't have an MBA. I didn't really have any investment background. So I said, what can I do? So I decided to make myself into the fundraiser. So I, not, you know, I wasn't a backslapping, golf playing, uh, you know, liquor drinking kind of guys, uh, you know, wearing suspenders all the time and, and going to country clubs, the kind of thing that I imagined fundraisers were doing. I, that wasn't me. So I basically made myself into a fundraiser and I learned how to do it and go around the world. And, and it was, you know, in the end, I learned that the best way to be a fundraiser when you're asking people for money is to let them talk initially, let them tell you what's on their mind, and then you can, you know, gauge what you want to say based on what they already are interested in and what they have on their mind. And then uh, it worked pretty well. So I would spend you know, three quarters of my time traveling the world. And it was a great experience because I get to meet people from 100 different countries. And uh, no sovereign wealth fund writes you a check in for $500 million right away. But uh, clearly, the sovereign wealth funds have become a major presence in the private equity world, uh, replacing or I think, uh, adding to what the public pension funds do. But now we also have uh, in, in retail money coming in, 401k money will eventually come in. And, and also uh, money from family offices, which are big growth business. So there's still plenty of money there to be raised, and I still am out raising it all the time. Um, my son is a graduate of Duke, an undergraduate. He went to business school at, at Stanford and, and law school there, and he's getting married this weekend, 
in, in San it. Francisco. Yeah. And so I look at my schedule and I think I'm going out there and I, I see Carlisle's scheduled fundraising meetings for me the day my son's, you know, day before my son's getting married. So <laughs> I guess I just have a reputation for liking to do fundraising. I don't know. <laughs> What's the advice you're going to give your son during the wedding? Can we get a sneak peek? Um, my advice is to, you know, get some good returns and uh, <laughs> get the MOIC up or get the IRR up, either one, and uh, you can raise more money. Excellent. Sophie's got a question. Yeah. Um, well, I'd love to ask you one question um, about your ESG strategy. Right. Um, so we, we talked about Paula Volant, um, who was on the yeah. IC at the National Gallery. Um, and I thought in your book, it was, it was quite interesting. Um, you asked her how she would respond to the idea that diversity, gender, and ethnic diversity is a, right. is a good social policy, and that it might lead to better returns. Do you, do you believe yeah. that? Well, ESG has, a, um, you know, has taken on uh, a life of its own. Uh, many people were proponents of it, are proponents of it, as we are. Um, and obviously there's been a backlash, and now many people are running away from it. Uh, Carlisle is still a gigantic uh, believer in ESG, and uh, though he, I do feel old though, when, when the woman who is really talented is running our ESG program, she was my daughter's classmate in college. So you know when somebody running a division of your firm is your daughter's classmate, you know you're getting old. But she, Meg Starr has done a wonderful job, and our view is, um, as all of you are probably familiar with this, the general view of investing is you, you should maximize the amount of opportunities and not minimize them by focusing on things like ESG. Um, that is the conventional view. It's not my view. My view is that uh, eventually ESG um, uh, will produce customers who want to be with companies that are good in ESG, employees, uh, suppliers, and eventually you're going to get the that people want to be with companies that, that are do it good in ESG. One of the problems ESG has had is, is defining it and putting a number aside it. So for example, uh, if you want to look at a company today, you can look at its PE ratio. There's one number for it. There's one number for a sharp ratio. But there's no ESG ratio. Somebody will win a Nobel Prize, like Bill Sharp did, for coming up with a ratio or a number that you can attach to a company and say, IBM or or Starbucks has an ESG rate ratio of X or Y or Z, whatever the number is. And then it'd be easier for people to assess it. Right now it's very complicated and much more complicated to assess what somebody's performance is on ESG, but ESG is not going away. There is some political backlash, but modest. In fact, I think Larry Fink has said publicly that while some states took away their money, maybe Florida as an example, because he was focused on ESG, more people have come in to thank Larry for being strong on ESG and have given him more money than he's ever lost. So I don't, I don't really think that money is going away because of ESG, in my view. Do you think there will be a time when maybe Carlisle would pay a premium for a company that had exceptionally good governance? We'll, we'll, we'll do what with a company? We'll not... Would maybe pay a premium for a company that had very good social well, governance policy? Well, we, we now look for companies that have good ESG performance, but every company isn't going to have good ESG performance. What you've got to do is say, what can we do to make it better? So we have a whole team that assesses what the ESG current record is of a company, and then what can we do to make it better? If we think that it's already perfect, I'd be surprised if we would think there's a lot of value for us to add. Just like we try to add value in other areas, we try to add value in ESG, and, and if we see there's a lack of interest in that in the company, we may not be that interested. You always can find some ways, I think, to improve the ESG performance. And we have a team of people that go in and assess that during due diligence. And then after we buy the company, they go in and try to implement it. And you know, it seems to be working OK. Great. Well, I think we're, we're conscious of your time. OK. Yes. Um, but we just want to thank you so much so, for well, Thank you. And I just say uh, thank you all for coming. And look, uh, Fuqua is a great school, part of a great university. I hope all of you who are students here recognize you're going to have a great degree. And I uh, hope all of you who are in the private equity world are pursuing what I call is, you know, the highest calling of mankind. I hope you're happy with it. I, I think the private equity world has some challenges now. Obviously, returns are going to be challenged for a while. Fundraising is more complicated than it was before. But we've been through these cycles before. And in the end, really talented people who work hard and have some vision of where they want to go are going to produce good returns. And, and I think we're rewarded for that. So thank you for inviting me. And uh, thank you for your questions, OK? Thank you so much.